After several turns, he sat down again. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell, that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with the chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment, and with a strange, inexplicable dread, that, as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound. But soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute, or a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bell ceased as they had begun, together. They were succeeded by a clanking noise, deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still, said Scrooge. I won't believe it. His color changed, though, when without a pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost, and fell again. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat. Tights and boots, the tassels on the ladder bristling like his pigtail, and his coat skirts, and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now, though he looked the phantom through and through, and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes, and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its head and chin, which wrapper he had not observed before, he was still incredulous, and fought against his senses. "'How now?' said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. "'What do you want with me?' "'Much?' Marley's voice, no doubt about it. "'Who are you? Ask me who I was!' "'Who were you, then?' said Scrooge, raising his voice. "'You're particular for a shade.' He was going to say, "'to a shade,' but substituted this as more appropriate." In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you... can you sit down? asked Scrooge, looking doubtfully at him. I can. Do it, then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair, and felt that in the event of its being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace, as if he were quite used to it. "'You don't believe in me,' observed the ghost. "'I don't. "'What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses?' "'I don't know,' said Scrooge. "'Why do you doubt your senses?' "'Because,' said Scrooge, "'a little thing affects them. "'A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats.' You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of the grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror for the spectre's voice disturbed the very marrow in his bones. To sit, staring at those fixed, glazed eyes in silence for a moment would play, Scrooge felt, the very deuce with him. 
There was something very awful, too, in the specters being provided with an infernal atmosphere of its own. Scrooge could not feel it himself, but this was clearly the case, for, for though the ghost sat perfectly motionless, its hair and skirts and tassels were still agitated as though by the hot vapor from an oven. You see this toothpick, said Scrooge, returning quickly to the charge, for the reason just assigned, and wishing, though it were only for a second, to divert the vision's stony gaze from himself. I do, replied the ghost. You are not looking at it, said Scrooge. But I see it, said the ghost, notwithstanding. Well, returned Scrooge, I have but to swallow this, and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins, all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug! At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry, and shook its chains with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom taking off the bandage round its head, as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Mercy, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost, do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge, I must. But why do spirits walk the earth, and why do they come to me?' 